Hi, this is Jose Figueroa for Inner Proof Workman, where we are rightly dividing the word of truth. Welcome to another week of Bible study. I am so glad you're here as we open up the scriptures. We are in our series on the book of Revelation. Come, Lord Jesus. If you're new to this Bible teaching ministry, here's where you can find out more information. You can go to my website, enapprovedworkman.org. That's an approvedworkman.org. You can find all the previous uh, series we have done in the podcast, subscribe to the podcast, and also catch up on any lessons you may have missed on the current series. You can also connect with me on social media. I'm on Instagram at an approved workman, and you can find both a Pinterest profile and a Facebook page uh, to connect with an approved workman. Last but not least, if you're watching the video of this lesson, then make sure you subscribe to either my YouTube channel or my Rumble channel so you're alerted to future episodes as they get uh, posted on those channels. So hopefully you can find a way to connect with me, connect with an approved workman. I look forward to it. Thank you. Today we're in lesson number 14 in a Revelation series, Come, Lord Jesus. Today's lesson is titled A Great Day of Wrath, Part 3. Our focus passage is Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. In Revelation chapter 6, the victorious Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, breaks the seals on that scroll so the judgments of God are unleashed on this earth. In our two previous episodes on Revelation chapter 6, we cover verses 1 through 11. We first look at the four faithful horsemen unleashed, verses 1 through 8. We learn that the unleashing of God's wrath on this earth will be devastating. As a way of application, we ask this question. How are you encouraged or challenged as you understand the severity of the upcoming divine judgment? Then last time we looked at verses 9 through 11, a multitude of martyrs praise. And the principle we learn is that God will preserve and will vindicate his people. We ask these questions. How willing are you to give your life for the word of God and your Christian testimony? How can you pray as you wait patiently for his justice to arrive? Today we are concluding our study of Revelation chapter 6. As a reminder, Jesus, the victorious Lamb of God, continues to break the seals on the scroll that grants him the authority to bring judgment on the earth. With the breaking of the first four seals, we saw the release of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. When the fifth seal was broken, we met the tribulation martyrs. In today's lesson, we're looking at the breaking of the sixth seal, number six, and we will see that the inhabitants of the earth will come to the full realization that a great day of wrath is upon them. The day of the Lord is here. Let's get some additional context for the passage before we begin our study in detail. First, Dr. James Montgomery Boyce in his book, Seven Churches, Four Horsemen, One Lord, gives us a good summary of what we have seen in Revelation 6 so far and what comes next. Quote, In the sixth chapter of Revelation, we have already been given a description of what human history will be like until the time of the end. It will be a time of military conquerors and tyrants, war, bloodshed, famine, and death. We have seen those who will be martyred for their faith during that entire period. They are gathered in heaven, waiting for God to be glorified by his judgment of the wicked and vindication of the righteous. That is our story at a glance. Therefore, there is nothing to stop us from moving forward rapidly to the end, as Jesus stretches out his hand and breaks the sixth seal. End quote. Let's now take a look at our outline and lesson goal for our teaching from Revelation chapter 6. We are in lesson 14, A Great Day of Wrath, part 3. And we have looked already at the four faithful horsemen unleashed, verses 1 through 8. Last time we looked at the multitude of martyrs that praise, verses 9 through 11. And our focus for today's lesson is our third division, The Day of Divine Wrath Arrives, verses 12 through 17. My goal for the teaching from Revelation 6 is this, to encourage believers to remember that the great day of the Lord is coming to this earth and no one can stop God's plan. Again, the goal for the lesson today is to encourage believers to remember that the great day of the Lord is coming to this earth 
and no one can stop God's plan. So let us go now to our first and only division for today. The day of divine wrath arrives. Revelation 6 verses 12 through 17. And I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became as black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Verse 15. Then the kings of the earth and the eminent people and the commanders and the wealthy and the strong and every slave and free person hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come and who is able to stand? Revelation 6, 12-17 when we look at verses 12 through 14 here, we see that John saw the lamb breaking the sixth seal. And here's what happened next. A lot happened. First, there was a great earthquake. Then the sun became as black as sackcloth and the moon looked red like painted with blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth, just as a fig tree dropped his unripe face when shaken by the wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll and every mountain and island was removed from its place. This language speaks of great cataclysmic disturbances in earth and in heaven. This is Day of the Lord language. The language here is also very similar to the words of Jesus in his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. First look at Matthew 24 verse 21. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will again. Then verse 29 of Matthew 24. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. You can find similar passages and references in Mark 13 verses 19 and then 24 and 25 and then Luke 21 verses 25 and 26. So the three synoptic gospels include this language from Jesus, these words of Jesus regarding the end times, and they are echoed very similarly here in Revelation chapter 6. In his book, Because the Time is Near, Dr. John MacArthur speaks about the timing for the breaking of this sixth seal. Here's what he had to say, quote, By the time this seal is opened, the tribulation's midpoint has passed, and the world is in the great tribulation. Matthew 24, 21. By then, the final Antichrist has desecrated the temple in Jerusalem, the abomination of desolation. The world worships him, and a massive persecution of Jews and Christians has broken out. The devastating natural disasters accompanying the sixth seal will be the most terrifying events ever to affect the earth." End quote. We see then that John is echoing the words of Jesus. But as we have seen in our study of Revelation thus far, John also has hundreds of allusions to the Old Testament included in the book of Revelation. This time of the Great Tribulation will be a devastating time on the earth. Such a terrible time has not occurred since the beginning of the world until that time and nothing so horrible will ever occur again. This is the end of history. Let's look at a couple of examples of this time period as referenced in the Old Testament. Remember, the Old Testament speaks of this time as the day of the Lord. It's judgment day for this earth. First, let's look at the prophets Daniel and Jeremiah, starting with Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands to guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress, such as never occur since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. This is also the time of Jacob's trouble, 
the time of judgment on the nation of Israel for the rejection of their Messiah, Jesus Christ. Look at Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Woe, for that day is great. There is none like it. And it is the time of Jacob's distress. Yet he will be saved from it. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Now let's look at Isaiah 13 and see if you don't hear something very similar to what John wrote in Revelation 6. Isaiah chapter 13, verses 9 through 13. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. So I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for the wrongdoing. I will also put an end to the audacity of the proud and humiliate the arrogance of the tyrants. I will make mortal men scarcer than pure gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place. At the fury of the Lord of armies, in the day of his burning anger. Isaiah 13, verses 9 through 13. And what about the prophet Joel? In Joel chapter 2 we read, first in verse 10, Before then the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon become dark, and the stars lose their brightness. Verse 30 of Joel chapter 2, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. And then verse 31. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. That's Joel chapter 2, verse 10, and then verses 30 and 31. So we have then both Isaiah and Joel speaking of cataclysmic events associated with the day of the Lord. The earth and heaven are shaken violently. It's an event like no other. There are other Old Testament prophets speaking of this time as well. For example, you can look at Ezekiel chapter 32 verses 6 through 8, or Habakkuk chapter 3 verses 6 through 11, Amos chapter 5 verse 20, and Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 15. Of course, we looked at Habakkuk, Amos, and Zephaniah when we did our study of the minor prophets a couple of years back. So this time, it will be a time like no other, a great day of wrath, the day of the Lord. Dr. G.K. Beale is a Bible scholar who has created a very useful commentary on the book of Revelation. His work is cited by both Dr. Heiser and Dr. Boyce, and here's what Dr. Beale says about the use of the Old Testament imagery by John in this passage on Revelation chapter 6. Quote, the judgment of the world is depicted with stock in trade Old Testament imagery for the dissolution of the cosmos. This portrayal is based on a mosaic of Old Testament passages that are brought together because of the cosmic metaphors of judgment they have in common. The quarry of text from which the description has been drawn is composed primarily of Isaiah 13 verses 10 through 13, Isaiah 24 verses 1 through 6, 19 to 23, then Isaiah 34, verse 4, Ezekiel chapter 32, verses 6 through 8, Joel chapter 2, verses 10, and verses 30 and 31, then Joel chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, and Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 6 through 11. Secondarily, we also have Amos chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 23 to 28, and the Psalms 68 verses 7 and 8, end quote. And again, that is a quote from the book of Revelation, a commentary on the Greek text by Dr. G. K. Beale. All these passages describe these upcoming events as devastating in nature. Listen to what Dr. Tony Evans says about this passage in Revelation 6 from his Bible commentary. Quote, the sixth seal brings disruption of nature, a violent earthquake, verse 12. The sun's turning black like sackcloth made of hair, which is likely because volcanoes erupting and spewing ash that blocks sunlight. 
the disruption of the moon, also verse 12, and stars of heaven, verse 13, splitting of the sky and the moving of the mountains and islands, verse 14. It will appear that God is undoing the created elements he formed in Genesis chapter 1, end quote. Makes me think of that phrase that Dr. Bill used, the dissolution of the cosmos. Something really, really amazing and terrible is happening. However, as we look at this passage more closely, we should notice that there is something else going on beyond the terrible physical signs in heaven and earth. In verse 13 of Revelation 6, we read that the stars of the sky fell to the earth. Jesus also said in Matthew 24 that at this particular time, the powers of heaven will be shaken. In scripture, spiritual beings are sometimes referred to as stars. This is a language used, for example, in Job to refer to angels, to the divine beings, the sons of God who rejoice in creation. Look at Job chapter 37, beginning in verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements, since you know? Or who stretched the measuring line over it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Job 37, verses 4-7. through 7. One of my favorite passages in Scripture Job has been asking questions and fighting with his friends for 36 chapters after what happened to him. And then he's been claiming that he wants to talk to God. God shows up and asks questions of Job. One of the questions he asks is, where were you when creation was made? And there is a reference to the morning stars, to the angels. They're also known as the sons of God. The Apostle Paul also referred to spiritual beings in terms of heavenly powers as he spoke of our spiritual battle in his letter to the Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 beginning in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Look at verse 12. Here's the key. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist on the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 13. Therefore, I believe that this time of judgment is not only for the inhabitants of the earth, but also for those spiritual beings who are in rebellion against God and who are influencing the works of evil in this world. Listen to Dr. Tremper Longman as he speaks to the reality of the influence of these rebellious spiritual powers. Quote, But that there are spiritual powers, good and bad, behind the various human institutions is a truth taught in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as well. That's Dr. Tremper Longman in his NIV commentary on the book of Daniel. And remember, hell, the ultimate destination for eternal judgment, was originally prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, verse 41. Can we find references in the Old Testament to this expected judgment of these spiritual powers? Yes, we can. Let's look first at Isaiah chapter 24, beginning in verse 19. The earth is broken apart. The earth is split through. The earth is shaken violently. The earth trembles like a heavy drinker and sways like a hot. For its wrongdoing is heavy upon it, and it will fall never to rise again. Look at verse 21. So it will happen on that day that the Lord will punish the rebellious angels of heaven on high and the kings of, of the earth on earth. They will be gathered together like prisoners in the dungeon and will be confined in prison. And after many days, they will be punished. Then the moon will be ashamed and the sun be put to shame. For the Lord of armies will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and his glory will be before his elders. 
Isaiah chapter 24, verses 19 through 23. The key verse is verse 21. There is punishment on the rebellious angels of heaven and also on the kings of the earth. We also have Isaiah chapter 34, beginning in verse 1. Come near your nations to hear, and listen, you peoples. Let the earth and all it contains here, and the world and all that springs from it. For the Lord's anger is against all the nations, and his wrath against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has turned them over to slaughter. So their slain will be thrown out, and their corpses will, be, will give up their stench. And the mountains will be drenched with their blood. And all the heavenly lights will wear away. And the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. All its lights will also wither away. As a leaf withers from the vine. Or as one withers from the fig tree. Isaiah 34 verses 1 through 4. The phrases their armies in verse 2. And its lights in verse 4. Can also be translated their host. Dr. Heiser tells us the following about that phrase. Pay close attention to what he says. Quote, Lord of hosts is Adonai Sebaot. The singular is Seba. It refers to an army or a group of the hosts of heaven, celestial objects. But Sebaam is that word with a plural suffix, their host, attached to it. If you do a search specifically on that word form with that suffix, Every time it's used in the Hebrew Bible, it speaks of celestial objects, not earthly armies. Every time. That's, end quote, that's Dr. Michael Heiser in a recent episode of his Naked Bible podcast on Revelation chapter 6. So when you look at Revelation chapter 6, judgment has come indeed on the inhabitants of the earth, and on the rebellious spiritual powers behind them. Dr. Michael Heiser spoke of this dual judgment in a recent episode of his Naked Bible podcast. Here's what he says, quote, It is very clear that God is going to judge both. At the day of the Lord, the human powers oppressing the people of God are going to get what's coming to them, and so are the spiritual powers going to get what's coming to them. He says, meaning John, and the stars of the heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree cast its on ripe figs when shaken by a great wind. And the heaven was split as a scroll having been rolled up. The phrase, stars fell from heaven, that is in Revelation 6.13, you can look that up in Matthew 24.29, Mark 13.25, end quote. That's Dr. Michael Heiser on his Naked Bible podcast, episode 370, on Revelation chapter 6. So again, that language that you see in the Old Testament passages, you see used by Jesus in Mark and Matthew, the stars fell from heaven, that is dealing with those spiritual powers of darkness in the heavenly places. So we have looked at the events that are unleashed when the sixth seal is open. We looked at that in verses 12 through 14 and what it means for this world the shaking of the heaven and the earth. Moving on to verse 15 of Revelation 6, how will the people on earth respond on that day? Will they repent from their sins? Will they cry out to God for mercy and compassion? Well, they will cry out, but not in repentance. John tells us that everyone on the earth, kings, eminent people, military commanders, the wealthy and powerful, everyone, slave or free, did the same thing. They hid themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Instead of going towards God, they tried to hide from Him like Adam and Eve tried to do after they fell. Dr. Chuck Swindoll in his Revelation commentary speaks about this universal reaction. He says, quote, Following the horrific events described in Revelation 6, 12-14, John records a frightful scene the complete and utter panic of the entire population of the world. Every kind of person, rich and poor, elite and common, will cry out in dread, hiding themselves like hunted animals in the cracks and crevices of the earth. Rather than rushing into God's merciful and loving presence by grace through faith, they will flee 
from him. Revelation 6, verses 15 through 17. End quote. So the judgment applied to everyone. No one could escape it. We have a reference again to Isaiah chapter 24. Look at verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord lays the earth waste, devastates it, twists its surface and scatters its inhabitants. And the people will be like the priest, the servant like his master, the female servant like her mistress, the buyer like the seller, the lender like the borrower, the creditor like the debtor. Isaiah 24 verses 1 and 2. In verse 16 of Revelation 6, they cried out for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them and hide them from the sight of the one sitting on the throne, God the Father, and from the wrath of the Lamb, God the Son. This again points to the deity, the divinity of Jesus Christ. He and the Father are one. Notice that this is their day of wrath. Jesus is God. One of the key messages, one of the key themes in the book of Revelation. We talked about that even going back to our first lessons. Jesus is God. And furthermore, all judgment has been given to him. Look at John 5, verse 22. So this cry of the wicked ones here also echoes the words of the prophet Hosea. Look at Hosea chapter 10, verse 8. Also the high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, will be destroyed. Thorns and thistles will grow on their altars. Then they will say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Isaiah 10, verse 8. In verse 17, the inhabitants of the earth will realize the great day of their wrath, the Lamb and the Father. The great day of the Lord had arrived, and no one could stand it. And yet, they will persist in their rebellion. They'd rather die a horrible death than to acknowledge their sins and return to God in hope of mercy. They know He is in control. They know no one can stop His day of wrath. And yet, their hearts are hardened. This is one of the saddest realities in the book of Revelation. We will see this time and again. Wicked people whose hearts are hardened beyond rescue. There is no hope for them. Dr. Boyce speaks of this response of the wicked, those who have rejected God. Here's what he says, quote, But the terror that is spoken of here is not of death. On the contrary, by contrast with what is actually terrifying the people on this day, death would actually seem welcome. The people will gladly accept death if the mountains and rocks will fall upon them and wipe them out. No, the terror that is spoken of here is not of death, but of God. He is what is terrifying the wicked. The wicked would rather die than appear before him. But appear before him they must. Now they are to be crushed by the one who was crushed by them, and judged by the one whom they unjustly judged. End quote. Well, that is the end of our third and final division in Revelation chapter 6. What is the principle? God's day of wrath will be unavoidable for the wicked ones. God's day of wrath will be unavoidable for the wicked ones. Look at Psalms chapter 1 verses 4 through 6. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Knowing God's judgment is certain and terrible, how are you moved to pray for those who don't know the Lord? Well, that's our lesson for today. We have covered a lot of ground in Revelation chapter 6. I have given you a lot of information in these three lessons. And when you study end times prophecy, it is very easy to get caught up in trying to make sense of all the symbols and all the possible interpretations. But if we did that, just that, we would miss the main point of this passage, in my view. This is about God and His character, about who He is and how we should respond to Him in light of that. So when I look at this upcoming great day of God's wrath, the day of the Lord, as described in Revelation 6, I see the following attributes of God. 
So I want to talk about each attribute in detail a little bit and then give you some references, some scripture references to reinforce that attribute. First of five, he is holy. Look at Isaiah chapter six, verses three to five, and then Hebrews 10, 29 to 31. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe to me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 29. How much more severe punishment do you think he will deserve, who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So God is holy. And because he's holy, he must deal severely and decisively with sin. The inhabitants of this earth who have rejected his ways will be judged for their sins. Second attribute, he is the judge. God is the judge. Look at Genesis chapter 18, verse 25. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Look at John chapter 5, verse 22. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. And Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great, a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne and books were open and another book was opened which is a book of life and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds and the sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and hades gave up the dead who were in them and they were judged each one of them according to their deeds then death and hades were thrown into the lake of fire this is the second death the lake of fire and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life he was thrown into the lake of fire. So God is the judge. And because he is the judge, he has authority to render judgment on this earth. His judgment is perfect and fair. He is the standard. We are not. The third attribute we have in this chapter is that God is love. Look at Second Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be discovered. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So God is love, and because he is love, there is still an opportunity to repent, to turn to him in faith, and escape the coming judgment. We're still in the age of grace. There is still time. So we have seen that first, God is holy. He is the judge. He is love. Fourth attribute here, he is faithful. Look at John chapter 10. Verses 27 to 29. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of their Father's hand. Romans 8, 37 through 39. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
2 Timothy 2 verses 12 and 13. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So God is faithful. And because he is faithful, he will preserve his people. And he will bring them safely to eternity with him, even if they lose their lives for his sake. Last but not least, not only is God holy, he is the judge, he is love, and he is faithful. He is sovereign. Look at Psalm 115 verse 3. But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things long past. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times things which have not been done. Saying, my plan will be established. And I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Ephesians 1.11 In Him we also have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things in accordance with the plan of His will. So God is sovereign, and because He's sovereign, His plans will be accomplished. His judgment will come to pass. No one can stop Him, and no one will be able to stand on the great day of His wrath. Knowing all this, how will you respond to the only sovereign God of the universe? If you don't know Christ, you still have time. However, don't delay. The time of the end is near, and today is your day of salvation. Come to Christ today. Well, that concludes our teaching from Revelation chapter 6. Thank you for being here today. Next time, we will begin the study of Revelation chapter 7. We're going to see that there is a pause in the breaking of the seals. There's a little stop before we get to the breaking of the seventh seal on the scroll. And we will meet a very large and a very interesting group of people that will have a significant role in the rest of the book of Revelation as the tribulation days advance. That will be next time. Until then, this is Jose Figueroa for an approved workman where we are rightly dividing the word of truth. May God richly bless you.